It's lovely to see everyone again. <clears throat> and, um, yes, it's yeah. Mother's Day in uh, the UK is another day. No, it's due, um, yes, it's, it's, oh, I don't know when it is. Yeah, I can't, I think we've had it already because we, yeah, of course we had yes, it. Yes, we've had it. It yes, was in March. Right. I don't know why. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah. I heard that. Yeah, that's so right. they're, they're actually yes. different, mm -hmm. whereas Malaysia follows that's Australia that's and... Um, Oh. Well, we've just been in um, one of the meetings that we help with, um, and that was a good time. We're still not allowed to sing. We're still officially, though one person can sing. Um, we have to wear masks, except when you're speaking. And of course, you have to sit socially, socially distanced, and uh, <clears throat> as they call it. But um, it's been, I know that um, I have a friend. I don't know whether any of you can remember um, a fellow named Stephen Bishwa. He's from the far northeast corner of India, Sikkim. And um, he and his wife um, have had their share of much trouble, but <clears throat> his below neighbor was rushed off to hospital and the police came straight in and have put those um, red and uh, sorry yellow and black protective things so he's not been allowed out and they to for food or anything quite quite a problem uh, for them but he's um, just wrote to me and i just picked up a message from him and you know they they live in the, the, the Indian churches up in his area, I think this would be general in various parts of India, tend to be exposed to so many voices and uh, so-called prophetic voices, um, some very peculiar things, um, uh, things like, you know, everyone needs to be sprinkled with the blood every morning and all kinds of unusual things and errors and and yet in the midst of it all Stephen often writes saying well what do you think of this Bernard and so I write back and um, try and help him as best I can probably several several times a week we are in touch. And <clears throat> one of the things that I'm so conscious of is this realm of what is really God doing in the new covenant? What is God doing? Um, what have we that the Jews did not have? And why is it that the Lord Jesus came and that the gospel has come into all the world? And when I look at these things, it strikes at this matter of inheritance, possessing our possessions. Now, if you can remember back into the Old Testament days, you will remember that, of course, God promised to Abraham, the father, <laughs> he promised to Abraham and the, his offspring this great, beautiful country. He set its boundaries, and this was the inheritance, a place of hills and valleys, of fertile fields, of rivers and springs, a place which was to be the, the, the place of heaven upon earth. Perhaps you never thought about it that way, but he gave them his law 
um, said he would choose a city to dwell in, that he would presence himself with them, that he would give them the land, and that if they would keep his ways, it would be like days of heaven upon earth. And you can look in Deuteronomy, you can look in Numbers, you can look in Exodus, and even in Leviticus, and you will find, of course, that what happened is that there was no fundamental heart change. So the inheritance was a place and a beautiful place. And that if they lived according to his law, there would be wondrous harmony in society. There would be wonderful fellowship man with man, woman with woman, man and woman, families, and so on and so on. And this they failed to keep. And uh, what the law did was show to them the frailty of their own heart and their inability to keep the law. No deep heart change. And what was very wonderful, of course, that forefather Abraham, to whom the promises were first made, and of course, Isaac, and even Jacob, Hebrews 11 tells us very clearly that when they got into the land that had been promised, they were hungry for something more than physical blessings. They, they were hungry for something more than uh, having a harmonious life, uh, having days of heaven <laughs> upon earth. They were hungry for something more. And this was expressed in the fact that Hebrews 11, one of the remarks that the writer says that they dwelt in tents. That's where they, they didn't build any city, um, the only thing that uh, Abraham built, of course, was altars, and he was peripatetic, he was nomadic, he was moving around, because he was looking for something much, much, much more. And his inheritance, he was seeking much more. It says, that uh, they didn't receive the promises. And um, it says this, and I'm just quoting from Hebrews 11, <clears throat> where by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, <laughs> He dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And so dear Abraham and his son and his grandson, they arrived at was what was promised, but what was promised, the inheritance that they arrived at, was insufficient to satisfy the great hunger and thirst of their hearts. And so they just dwelt in tents there. They made no permanent dwelling there because they knew that the God who had spoken <laughs> to them had promised uh, indirectly, not explicitly, something much, much more. And perhaps the only more explicit promise was made way back in Exodus, if you may remember, and in Deuteronomy, where the promise of the land is made and God specifically says I want a people 
I want my son. I want my people to be a kingdom of priests. That's what he said. And <clears throat> then he said this, that it was not physically possible for all the nation to be priests, just wasn't physically possible. And so a certain family, a certain tribe, had to be separated on behalf as representative of all of them. And what was said by the Lord to these people, you're going to have no inheritance in the land. You're not going to have any geography. Um, you will be tithed to by the people. So you will be kept. Mm -hmm. You will be looked after, but you, you will have no inheritance in the land. So for the tribe of Levi, there was no permanent area given to them. And the Lord said, I am your inheritance. You will inherit me. You will inherit me. Now, keep that very firmly uh, in your heart. That the intention of God from the beginning is not so much to do with geography, not so much to do with plenty, possessions, not to do with comforts and so on. I want to give you myself. I am your inheritance. Abraham perceived that. Isaac obviously perceived it, and even Jacob which explains to you something of Jacob's up and down life as he struggled with issues to do with physical possessions all his life long. And it was only at the end that he realized that what he, he needed was intimacy with God. Now, one of the things that you will discover that has happened to us in our world in the last probably 120 years, particularly, <laughs> is the psychology, um, psychologizing of our language. And this is a, a realm of danger. And one day I'd like to talk at length, the replacement of biblical words, which is so much richer with words to do with the soul, with the psyche. So for instance, the scripture consistently uses the word like the tabernacle of meeting. So if you were to go through numbers and all these places, you will find the tabernacle of meeting, the meeting you will find there I will commune with you. There you will be face to face. There you will have intimacy. The kind of language that you discover in, for instance, the Song of Solomon, where, which is a love poem, as you know, and it's, it's actually a, a, a book that many Christians don't like because of its intimacy, its intimate language, its, its love language, its face-to-face -face language, its mouth-to-mouth -mouth language. You'll see where I'm going in a, min in a minute. And yet God placed it there in the scriptures for us. Now, instead of, for instance, the word communion and fellowship, you know, uh, the psychologizing of language, we talk about relationships. 
well, I have a relationship. We went to this meeting this morning, and as we parked in the parking lot <clears throat> and made our way to the hall, there was, it's by a big park, and there's a gentleman uh, with two dogs and uh, on great long leads, one had got loose and he was bellowing at this dog, um, which, of course, obviously he knew by name. He was getting consistently more and more angry with the dog because the dog had found some interesting smell to smell. You know, but this man, no doubt, has a very happy relationship with his dog or his two dogs, you see. I mentioned that we have a sister who comes to see us. Sometimes we go to see her, recently widowed, and she has a cat called Aslan. And there's no doubt that she has a relationship with the cat. <laughs> and the cat is nice and it's a big one and a friendly one. Um, even comes and says hello to me. I'm known as a cat lover, and um, though I like dogs as well, but I like people better, by the way. <laughs> but um, you know, it's it's it, it, you you can have a relationship, but you can't have communion. You're not of the same spirit. You're not of the same powers. When God made you and me. He, grant, he made us in his image and likeness and granted to us powers that are not identical to the powers even of angels. Not even of angels. I don't know if you've done any real searching of scripture. Mm -hmm. I know that Wesley wrote, um, sing choirs of angels, sing in exaltation. I know he wrote that, but you won't find, if you carefully look in the Greek, you won't find angels singing. You will find them speaking and saying as though there is a power that you and I possess, that God granted to us, that where we are able to have a totality of involvement in, in song and word and music and powers that were given to us, powers of communion. Now, the cat doesn't have those powers. And Aslan, you know, not to what's his name's Aslan, not C.S. Lewis's Aslan, but B.B.'s Aslan behind her on the wall. Um, you know, the cats don't have this power, the felines, canines, you know, but we do, and no man can be satisfied. You know, a woman can be satisfied deeply, except they're made alive unto God through Jesus by his bloodshed and in the power of the spirit ushered into our inheritance. Your inheritance is God. Now I think <coughs> of a man, I never uh, met him though I talked to him on a number of occasions and you will have heard of him I think some of you whose name is Jeffrey Bull and he wrote a number of books now when he was a youngish man he was captured in Tibet by the Chinese and incarcerated for a number of years in a prison and they attempted to brainwash him. He had no Bible, but of course he carried with him into the prison cell. He carried his memory. He carried a loving heart for God. He carried those states of being where he enjoyed communion with God. Mm -hmm. They could not take that away. And that's a wonderful thing. 
And that was inheritance. So though he was poor, though he was incarcerated, though they were attempting to brainwash him, they had no success, by the way. And in the end, they gave up and shipped him out, um, just gave up on him. And but because he carried his inheritance in his heart and in his mind, he inherited a, a, a relationship. There I am using that wo word uh, instead of the word fellowship with God, communion with God. And, uh, you know, this is so important that we, we grasp it. And you get hints of this all the way through the Old Testament, that there were many, even in the Old Testament times, who longed for this communion much more. And, of course, we are moving toward uh, following in the steps of Jesus, where we will see face to face, then shall we know even as we are known. Now abides faith, hope, and love. Um, but of course, you know, there's going to be a time. And by the way, when you read in the scriptures about the body, um, you know, the body, body of the church. The church is the body of Christ. Don't just think of individual members of it. Paul is not only talking about, um, for instance, the church that we go to, uh, there are various members. It's not an official membership but God is joining it together. But when Paul's talking about the church as the body of Christ, you see, he's saying much more than individual members. There is a body of the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are a body of gifts. So that if you think of your physical body, it is a perfect gathering together of various organs. Your skin is an organ, isn't it? Your lungs are an organ. Your heart is an organ. Your kidneys are an organ. And you will appreciate that you are a body. And as you reflect on this, Understand that if we took one of your lungs away, um, you would still be able to live. One of your kidneys, you'd still be able to live. There are compensations. But if we took your heart away, then you would die. Now apply that. Apply that to the life of the church, if you take away love, if you take away love, just think about it. If you take away faith, you see, if you take away hope, take away hope and the powers will diminish. You take away faith, the powers will diminish. You take away love and the church is dead. There is a body of spiritual life that we need to be in. And now apply it to the, the gifts of the spirit. You can take away tongues, you won't die. You can take away interpretation of tongues, you, you won't die. You can take <laughs> away miracles and you won't die. You can take away, and so I could go on. And if I was to add to the body of gifts, then... You know, if you take away apostles, you see, the church will die. There are certain fundamentals that must be present. Now, don't 
make some great upbuilding idea of apostles and so on. A, a true apostle couldn't care less what you called him, really. Paul, Paul <laughs> basically only used the word apostle about himself when he was false to. He would rather say, I, the chief of sinners, am. You know, that's, that was his preference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there are certain things you take away mm -hmm. from the church. So if all you've got is teachers, the, ch the church will be weakened. If all that you've got is evangelists, it won't die, the church won't die, but it will be weakened. There's a body, and some people make much of this, and they'll talk about the five-fold ministries that Jesus <laughs> gives to the church, you know, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, they divide it into five. Some people divided it up and into four, they lumped together pastor, teacher, and so on. But if you remove any of those, you, you appreciate you're going to weaken the church. And so think about these sorts of things and that there are certain things that are vital now i go back so the church is not going to inherit all it can if it is closing its heart to certain of those elements of the body and you're closing your heart too, if you're not growing in love and increasing in faith and abounding in hope. It's a whole body of, that are joined together. And how important this is for us to grasp. And, you know, you go back into, uh, I'm in Numbers, of course, chapter 12. And I just want to apply this to a fundamental misunderstanding that Miriam and Aaron had <laughs> that endangered the whole nation from entering in. Well, it actually stopped them journeying. It stopped them journeying. So if you go in your Bible to Numbers 12, and you can see, now everyone here knows that Miriam, Aaron, and Moses were siblings. We all know that, don't we? I, as far as I understand, Aaron was the oldest, Miriam was next, and then Moses was the younger of the trio. And yet the Lord chose Moses. Now, <clears throat> we look in chapter 12 of Numbers, verse 1, then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian or the Cushite woman whom he had married. Almost certainly that doesn't mean that Moses had married a second wife. It's, it's referring to Zipporah the wife that he had taken in the house of Jethro. You remember when he was out there in the wilderness. So it's almost as though something has been rankling away in the hearts of these two. A number of things had been rankling away in them, irritating them about Moses for a long while. And incidentally, to marry a Cushite woman was not forbidden. To marry an Amorite or to marry a Jebusite woman or to marry a Hittite or to marry, a, you understand, that was forbidden. But a Cushite woman, no, it wasn't forbidden. So Moses had done nothing wrong. And you notice, so they said, verse 2, 
has Moses, the Lord indeed spoken only through <coughs> Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man, Moses, was very meek, very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Why was that, by the way? Why was that? Uh, I'll touch on that in a minute. <laughs> Suddenly, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Now let's get the picture very clear. Let's look at this first of all. Notice the order of the name. And you're beginning to get a clear a clue of what can begin to stop the church journeying into all that God has for it, all the inheritance that God has for you. You see, God wanted to take Miriam in and Aaron in and Moses in. You, you understand all the people he wanted to take in. And here's a thing that will prevent, it will impede the journey. Because if you look at the end of the chapter, you will find it says explicitly this. Verse 15, Miriam was shut out of the camp. Seven days. And the people did not journey until Miriam was brought in, brought in. She was put out. And we'll come to that in a minute. But it all began. It all began with the fact that they had got the various parts of the body out of order. Miriam was a part of the body. Aaron was a part of the body. But you notice that verse 1, the order of the names tells you exactly who the dominant person was. The fermenter, if you like, of the trouble. Miriam, out of order. And you know, jealousy springs, and I want to apply this to churches because I have been very aware that one of the things that impedes the churches of Jesus moving on into all the inheritance at the tabernacle of real meeting with God is when jealousies come in and elders, leaders, lady pastors, this, that and the other begin to assert themselves and, if you like, observe and criticise some apparent shortcoming, as Miriam and Aaron did. Now, it may be, of course, that you notice that they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Now, the answer to that is no. Miriam is exaggerating had the lord spoken through miriam now you think back in your mind had the lord spoken to her through her 
Uh, had she not sung when they came out across the Red Sea, do you remember? Had she not had a wonderful place? Had the Lord not spoken through Aaron? Uh, you see, it's not a matter of whether he had or he hadn't, because he had, but it's a matter of each in their place, each organ, if I may put it that way, in his body, working together. And so there's something moving in Miriam and Aaron, which maybe has been exacerbated by something that happened in chapter 11. So if you look in chapter 11, do you remember how that Moses was way down with all the work. And so the Lord said to Moses, verse 16, chapter 11, gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, bring them to the tabernacle of meeting. There it is again to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and will talk with you there, and I will take of the spirit that is upon you and will put the same upon them. Now, let me transfer this over into the New Testament. Jesus has ascended up on high. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. He sends the Spirit uh, on the day of Pentecost to those who are standing with him. You can see here that God came down and talked with Moses. Look carefully, verse 17. I will come down and talk with you there, Moses, and I will take of the spirit that is upon you and will place it upon them. That's the ones, the people with you will receive the same spirit that is on you. Everyone getting this? It's important because if you try and get a Holy Spirit without standing there with our mediator, Jesus, our mediator is not Moses, our mediator is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you can all remember that on the day of Pentecost, they were stood there with Jesus in heart, men and women, <coughs> men and women, old and young. Mary was there. She would have been in her 50s at this point, no doubt. And uh, Nathaniel and others would have been older in years. And so they were standing there with Jesus in spirit. And the Lord took of the spirit that was on his son in heaven and poured that same spirit upon those who were with Christ. Then Peter preaches. And what does he preach? He preaches God. He preaches Jesus. He preaches the cross. People, uh, the Holy Spirit works with him. And lo and behold, there are many thousands of people who hear and they are convicted in their hearts. What shall we do? Well, this is what you do. You are to repent. You are to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. 
And so these people were called from everything else, whether they were far off or whether they were near, they were called away from being far off or called away from being just near like the Jews were. And they were called to stand there 100% by their baptism in water to stand there with Jesus. And the guarantee was that they would receive the Holy Spirit. You can see how closely allied that ministry of the Spirit is to the person of Jesus. If I won't come under his lordship, I will not re realize and experience his spirit. If I do not stay in the fellowship and communion of Jesus, then the spirit given unto me years ago will be grieved and quenched and I will cease to journey in to all the inheritance of the enjoyment of peace and joy and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. I will cease to live in the inheritance of being a loving man, a hopeful man, a believing, faithful man, I will cease to be that. I will begin to, I won't die, but I'll begin to lose strength and power and so on, just as someone would if they have an organ removed. And so here it is. Now this had happened and lo and behold, these people, 70 began to prophesy. So a power not granted to them before, now they were exercising that power. Even two of them, verse 27, but there's these two Eldad and Medad who hadn't gone to the tent of meeting, uh, like they should have done, and the Spirit still came upon them, and they prophesied, and this was, uh, you know, the Spirit rested upon them, and if you look in verse 25, and this is unusual, because some versions say that the Spirit came, rested upon them, they prophesied, although they never did so again. And some versions will say, and did not cease. <laughs> some versions actually say, and they did not cease. In other words, they retained that power of prophetic utterance under the inspiration of the Spirit for the rest of the time. And what did God do? He, he was making differences here. He was making a provision for his church. He wanted his people of the Old Testament to inherit all that was possible for them. He wanted them to inherit not only what Moses was giving, but what was available, you know, in every area of the camp. You understand that there was more than a million people in the camp. And far too many to be directly uh, involved with Moses and so the Lord was making provision for, uh, for wisdom and grace to come prophetically in the midst of things right there right there in the camp and uh, that's one of the reasons why I tend to err toward the idea that they did not cease because the church needs the word of the Lord. But it's very possible that this was the kind of straw that broke the camel's back as far as Miriam and Aaron were concerned because they weren't included. They weren't among the 70. They didn't get this particular blessing. They didn't get this role, as it were. And they just got thoroughly. It just was an added thing that irked their spirit. And going back into chapter 12, 
you you find that the Lord comes down because the man Moses, verse three, was very humble or meek. Now I, I want to say this to you that the key to his meekness and his humility is found in verses six, seven, and eight. The key to Moses' meekness, that which had made him that kind of man, meekness and humility is the opposite, opposite to self-assertiveness. It's important that we grasp that. It is the opposite to a man <clears throat> asserting himself in leadership in a church or a woman asserting herself. I think of a church that I preach in quite regularly in Mexico. And it's a lady and there's a widow who has the church has just come into being to a degree around her. But she's quite a remarkable lady because, you know, uh, as soon as my friend Javier comes on the scene and I come on the scene, she cannot wait to give space. She cannot wait to give space. There, there's not something self-assertive about her. Now, the key, of course, to this, for Moses, of course, was where he lived. And God gives this testimony to this man, Moses. Verse 6. Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. hope we're all listening to this and God speaking. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. Now, just, just, uh, just consider, this is God speaking about his servant. And he's talking about in all my house, not a part of the house. Think what I said earlier about the body of gifts, about the largeness of things about the, the marrying together of all things. He's, he's familiar with all my house. It's different. It's almost as though the Lord is saying, he's somewhat familiar with the heights and the depths and the lengths and the breadths. <clears throat> He's not obsessed with a particular doctrine. Somehow, he's gone beyond the confines of his mind and putting it all together neatly and tidily. Mm -hmm. He's in all my house. And then the Lord says, I speak with him mouth to mouth, mouth to mouth. Um, your version, like mine, probably says face to face, but it's one of those few occasions where it's not actually uh, face, but it's mouth. Um, <coughs> and that will immediately bring to your mind, or it should, books like the Song of Solomon let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Let me, uh, you know, the breath 
you're right back there in Genesis chapter 2 where God breathed in face to face but breath with breath there is he's not someone who just hears words this Moses that I've drawn out that's what his name means the drawn out one the one I've drawn out and I've drawn out of the world and I've drawn out of all his false hopes. He thought he was going to be a deliverer with the strength of the flesh. And instead he, he, he left Egypt and he made his way into the wilderness and he was drawn out to the mountain. And there it was and I drew him to myself. Um, I speak to him plainly. Lovely word. Um, I, I speak to him by appearings. He, he sees me. He's, he breathes my spirit. And he goes on and he says, uh, and not in riddles, not dark sayings, my version says, I speak with him face to face, even with great appearings. I love this, of course, with Abraham. You may remember him sitting in the heat of the day in a tent mouth. Yes. And uh, he observes in the heat of the day, three personages coming by. And he immediately discerns. And uh, he, he, there's, there's a sensitivity about Abraham. And he discerns and God speaks to him. You remember. And this is what the Lord says in carrying on in verse 8. He sees the form of the Lord. You know, one of the things that the Lord is trying to say to us, look, this kind of communion is what I want you all to have. This kind of relationship that brings balance of mind and you cannot live like that and retain a proud self-assertive attitude you cannot live in that you cannot you know to be in the lord's presence to be someone who is mouth to mouth, someone who is being escorted by the blessed spirit of communion into all the house, all the house, all the house of truth, all the house of, all the house, say the house of election. Do you, you know what election means, don't you? Choosing, you see, People argue about it in the church. They get a little bit like, well, I'm, I'm of Calvin. I, I believe in the sovereignty of God and that God elects and chooses and, and that's that. And then you get others who will say, well, I'm of Arminius. Who, and, and what Arminius was doing was reacting against Calvin was reacting against Calvin's emphasis. In, you see, in the end, if you live in all the house of God, then you will find there's a room in God's house of truth that is all about election. God has chosen you. God has chosen you. God is sovereign in all things. There's a great, great, great room in his house where, where you breathe God in that room and you'll have a great sense of his electing love, his choosing power, his immense working through all things. And, and you must be in all that room, you, but also you live in the spirit and he will take you into the room of his house that's all to do that God has given to you the powers of choice that you choose, that you respond. 
And this is a little bit what God's trying to say <laughs> about his friend Moses. Abraham was his friend. And, uh, you know, uh, Moses was a friend, a servant of the Lord in all the house. And, you know, I, I want to inherit, don't you, all that is available to me? To me in this time, you see. And I don't want to be stuck on riddles and prophecies, you know, and you can just think of this, how dear Paul says this, doesn't he? You know, as for prophecies, they'll cease. They'll cease. <coughs> in fact, he goes further than that because the actual word for cease in 1 Corinthians 13, you could translate it like this. As for prophecies, there will be times when they just won't work how about that they just won't work now we live in if you're from a charismatic church background you will know that there are some people who just you know uh, are running for the next prophet you know and some prophecy and they live by these things but I found again and again there's times when they just won't work they don't settle the heart, you see. They don't bring tranquility that is permanent and deep in the heart. And then when you, and of course, you live in this kind of great house of God, what's it going to do for yourself? Well, it's going to stop you asserting yourself. You're going to be humble without hardly realizing it's happening to you. I will be humbled without, I will be, oh Lord, you're so tender, you're so brave. You see, because he beheld the form of the Lord. He sees the form of the Lord. Now, you know, no one can see God at any time. You know, God is still immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. He's still that. There is that in God that cannot be seen and there's that in god that is seen in jesus christ that's why he came but are you getting the feel of this as I, i'm trying to share this with you and you know that in many church scenes that we have today and not only today but in former days we have a few who are key people. You take them away from the body of Christ. You take Moses away. And I tell you, the body of Christ will die. In one sense, that's impossible. You see, but God has to have his Moses, who sees the form of God. The proportions of God. What is that man called? Who was the, the great illustrator, the great scientist? Um, Leonardo da Vinci. Nothing to do with the code. And do you, some of you know that he uh, made a diagram of a man. I think it's called the Vituperian Man, where... He has the wonderful proportions of the head and the torso and the arms and every part of the body of man. And he's showing these beautiful proportions, the form of man. This is one of the reasons why certain uh, architectural things 
they respond to the proportion of man. Now understand that this great God of ours, you know, oh, the wonderful form of God. You understanding what I'm trying to say? And Moses, Moses is not, uh, you, it, all of this has humbled him. It's all, it's broken him. He, he's melted. He's of all men most meek because his life has been brought into proportion to God. And this is what's made him great. David said, your gentleness has made me great. And, you know, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Well, didn't you sense this about your brother? Didn't you sense it, Miriam? Didn't you sense it, Aaron? Why did that not cause you to be accepting, quiet-hearted, meek yourself, so that all the ministry that I'd given to you as, as, as priest Aaron and as someone to sing and lead praises like you, Miriam, why, why were you not humbled? So the anger of the Lord, verse 9, was aroused against them, and he departed. If I point this out to you in this chapter, can you notice, and I'm now back in verse 5, the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle stood in the door of the tabernacle. So the three of them didn't go in. By the way, does everybody understand that this tabernacle, of course, was the tent of Moses? You remember he came down from the mountain and they'd sinned against the Lord. And so Moses had interceded and Moses took his own personal tent outside the camp and God's presence came down there so the presence of God removed from the camp itself and went to Moses tent and Moses went there and the people would come out of their tent doors to observe Moses, and they saw the glory of God coming down there, and Joshua went out there, and if anybody wanted to seek God, they had to go outside the camp. Outside the camp. Now, some of you will know in Hebrews 13, let us go to him outside the camp, outside the religious camp. Jesus was crucified outside the city wall. The place of communion is the place of the cross. The place of communion is the place uh, of that mountain called Golgotha, the place of the skull. The place of the skull is the place where the skull has got a hole in it, a socket into which the cross was placed. All of these things speak outside, you know, outside, and Moses is outside the camp, and the people who wanted to seek counsel, they went outside the camp. They went to the tent where God was, and they heard from this man what God was saying. And, <clears throat> you know, you notice that they weren't allowed in at this point because there's sin. They weren't allowed in because there was jealousy. They weren't allowed to journey because there is this kind of fighting going on and squabbling and not acknowledging of the different places and 
the largeness. And God stood in the door of the tabernacle and he called them to him. And so back in verse nine, it says, the anger of the Lord was aroused against them and he departed. And when the cloud departed, verse 10, from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous. As white as snow, then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us, in which we have done foolishly, and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead, whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. Isn't that a graphic sort of language, not the sort of language that we would use? But you just reflect on this, brothers and sisters. You know that she, she was horrible to look at. There were pieces missing to her. It's almost as though this leprosy that had come to her, that had eaten away parts of her flesh, was almost like a parable to her of what she'd allowed to take place in her heart. Because she'd allowed precious things from God to be eaten away out of her. But her jealousy had done that. Her bitterness had done that. And it's almost as though her soul was profoundly incomplete, just like her body now was. And Moses cried to the Lord and said, uh, please heal her. Oh, God, I pray. Then the Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit on her face, would she not be shamed seven days? If you want to know what that implies, it simply means that it was common in those days that if a daughter had, or a son had behaved disrespectfully to parent and the father had spat upon that person, that member of the family, they would have to be put out temporarily, seven days. Uh, so the Lord says, let her be shut out, excommunicated, exiled from the camp, seven days, and afterward she may be received again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days and the people did not journey till Miriam was brought in again the word again doesn't come brought in brought in brought in that's the emphasis not on again but again brought in you see we've got to be brought in we've got to be brought in to the heart of God we've got to be brought in from our petty fogging arguings and bickerings and you know when I think of Moses so meek and humble of attitude you know He'd spent so much time in the presence of God. He had, he had been humbled thereby. Some of you, I know, will not have been to Europe. You know, you won't have been to Paris to see the massive church there. You won't have been to, you know, even in our city here where we live, as I walk down to the town, which is about a, 25 minute brisk walk and we're up on a hill and we look down and the city is in a valley and right in my vision right across the other side of the river is this great steeple so 
high, so high. And um, you know, the reason they built those things was to bring home to people's hearts, worshippers' hearts, God is high, God is great. God is so great. And of course, this is one of the things we tend to miss about God, the awe and the greatness of God when you just have an auditorium with tiered seats and a massive stage and a band at the front and it's a concert hall. You see, you can understand even, even architecture is speaking to you. But if we live you see, and this is the this is our inheritance. We are through our Lord Jesus by the Spirit to live in the tent of meeting. And I, I will uh, draw to an end by taking you. And I, I wanted to just sort of, how can I put this to you without leaning too heavily upon it? But if we remove this, if we remove this, we're the churches will die. There must be those in the midst who are mountain men. And I emphasize men. You see, you can all recall the long drawn out process that Moses went through for 80 years, where he was brought to nothing concerning himself. And how the Lord met him on a mountain. That bush that was burning. And you will all be aware that the Lord said to him, I want you, Moses, to bring them here. Will you do that? You must do that. Bring them here. And so out of Egypt they came. And they were brought to that mountain. And I, I, I don't want to, to hold back in saying this. You understand that our mountain is the New Jerusalem mountain. That our mountain is the Golgotha mountain. It's the place of crucifixion. It's the place of glory. It's the place of height, it's the place of depth, it's the place of length, it's the place of breadth, and that the Lord would bring us all there. But in order for him to do that, you know, he had to, in the Old Testament, he had to bring one man there, and then that man had to bring the others there under the leadership of God, and he brought them to the foot of the mountain. And they camped at the foot of the mountain, and Moses went up the mountain. So he met God on the mountain early on in the book of Exodus. Then he was called up the mountain in Exodus 19. And I'll just, and this is the hinge of church life, brothers and sisters. This is what will keep a church alive. You know, they, he went up the mountain, chapter 19 of Exodus. Have a look here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Read chapter 19. Then take time to read chapter 24. Here's the second time. He's taken up the mountain. And God calls him up. Chapter 24 of Exodus. And look at verse 12. Come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone. And the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. I don't want to say too much, but.
But I will say to you that in the churches of today, there are many men well-intentioned teaching what they have not received on God's mountain. They have received it from the internet. They've received it from mechanistic language. For instance, the law of the 72 and the 12 and the three. And some of you will have never heard of that, but that's one of the latest schema that is being taught as a key to church life. Jesus had 72, then he had 12, and out of the 12, he had three. You cannot apply those kinds of things because God's church is a living thing. So Malaysia is different. Mark this carefully. The assemblies of God must not apply rigidly certain laws because every church is unique because it is made up of unique members. The aggregate of that that God has joined together. How can we keep alive? How can the church be fruitful? How can the church be added to? There must be the kind of Moses figures. Come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you. And it'll be in that atmosphere. All of this is part of the great secret that made him meek. Where did you get it from, Moses? I got it from God. Where did you get it? On the mountain. What was it like up there? Oh, it was a mixture of, of awful love and terrible holiness. I found my heart filled with fear. I found my heart stilled from all its natural movements. I found my heart broken and dependent upon God. I found my heart filled with wonder. I found my heart with nothing to say and only to listen. You see, this is the hinge of the church. You do away with this member of the body and the body will die. And here's Moses, and he goes up, and dear Joshua, his assistant, goes up with him. And then God says, now, a little bit further, Moses. And I know many of you, brothers and sisters, have walked with the Lord many years. And I want to say this to you all. The Lord says, I want you to come further up. I want you to come further in. I want to give you further perspective. I want to show you my heart. I want to show you my form as you've never seen before. I want to take you into all my house so that you don't become obsessed with Calvinism or obsessed with, you know, these things, even things like conspiracies. And I've said again and again, I believe, of course, that the devil is the great conspirator and his wicked conspiracy is coming to its awful harvest. I believe, of course, that the Western world is being sold a diet of neo-Marxism, of course I believe that. And that there's wickedness in high places and so on. But I've got to see that against the background that God, God leads an individual man through mountains of difficulties. And sometimes it's the only way he can bring that man into the greatnesses of his heart. 
It's the only way you can do it. Hallelujah. And, you know, if you just take another little step, I'm almost done, into chapter 32, where Moses has to go up again. And in 32 of Exodus, these chapters are worth really taking your time in. So remember, Moses meets God on the mountain when he's 80. He brings the people to the mountain. He gets called up the mountain and he stays there 40 days, 40 nights. He, the people err down below, Aaron leads them all wrong. And he breaks the tablets of stone, does Moses, and grinds the idol Jehovah to bits. And then Moses is called up the mountain again. And that's chapter 24. And he's given the pattern of everything. And then he's called up the mountain again in chapter 33. And it's very wonderful. So he has 120 days up there or in all. And you find this that uh, Moses meets with the Lord. It's tremendous. And chapter 34 is the place of his meeting on the mountain. But if you look in chapter 33, it says in verse 7 of chapter 33, Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting which was outside the camp. So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he'd gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the temple tabernacle door, and all the people rose and they worshipped. Each man in his tent door, so the Lord spoke to Moses as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp. But Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. And then finally, chapter 34, here's your shining face. Verse 29, where dear Moses has been up there. Tremendous. I haven't got time for it, so it's... I've been speaking about an hour and 15 minutes, so I should stop. But, you know, dear Moses, you know, wonderful. He says, oh, Lord, you'll find this in chapter, at the end of chapter 33. Oh, I want to. Don't, don't take us anywhere, Lord. Don't let us journey. Please don't take us unless you're going to be with us. Please don't let us journey without you. And uh, dear Moses says, please show me your glory. Verse 18 of chapter 33, show me your glory. Please, please, please <laughs> don't think of a cloud, will you? You know, show me your glory. What's the glory of God? It's not a cloud. You know the word glory? Back there in the Old Testament, it means weight. Something that's heavy. Show me your glory, Lord. Show me your weight. Ah, then verse 19 of chapter 33, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Now you're beginning to touch something of his glory. 
I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Wonderful. In chapter 34, it says, The Lord descended in a cloud, verse 5, and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, Bounding in truth, in goodness and truth. Five things. Here's, here's your glory. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. Do you know, if you were to look up those words in the Hebrew language, you would find... That these are the words that Daniel uses and he comes to God and says, oh, but God, you said that you were this. This is what David would say when things went wrong in the Psalms. This is what they'd, they'd always say. But you said this is what you were like. Lord, don't you do that. Don't do that. Don't do the other. This is what you're like. And so what is taking place there through Moses and to Moses becomes the key of everything in the future. And the church will only journey. You will only journey. I will only journey. You know, if I'm purified of my jealousy, if I'm brought into the order of God, if I accept the judgments of God upon self, if I go that mountain route, that's the only way. I think the title today was Jealousy, Judgment, Journeying. And I hope there's something relevant to us. In, in what I've tried to share. You know, Moses said, don't take us up, please, unless you go with us, Lord. Unless you go with us. And if there are any leaders that will listen to this or who are listening to this, I can only exhort you to increasingly become a man with whom the Lord can say, you're my friend. You're faithful in all my house. In all my house. In all my house of truth. In all my house. With all. Hallelujah. And no wonder dear Paul prayed, <clears throat> didn't he? That we might know the length and breadth and depth and height. Amen. Amen. I hope what I've shared is of some help to us. I know that you want to journey. So be done with jealousy. Be done with comparing yourself. Be done with, you know, whatever it is that makes you leprous. You know, so that you're a malformed person you know uh, God make us whole eh? you say to me how can God make me whole well look at me he says you'll become like me and for this you were made this is your inheritance we're back where we began that you should inherit God God is your friend. God is your person of fellowship. God and everyone else who's in God. So that, praise his name, 
praise his name, Moses becomes your friend. Abraham becomes your friend. Everyone who's there with God, all things are yours. All things are yours. Whether Peter, whether Paul, whether Apollos, whether this one, that one, the other one. Amen. Amen. Thus are we made rich. Amen. Thank you, BB. I'm I think I should finish. Mm -hmm. Amen. Are you all right, darling? Mm -hmm. Thank you, brother. Mm -hmm. Feel free, everybody, to Amen. respond to the word of the Lord. Yes. Lead Lord. us in prayer. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed Father. Gracious Father. Oh, Lord. Hallelujah. Mm. Yes. Father. Lord, so many of the people are here are from Malaysia. Lord, and we want to stand. We want to pray for every church that is represented, represented on this Zoom, every church, every church. May at the heart of every church be people like this, Lord, people of the mountain, people of your presence, the heart of every church. Lord, every church, draw people, draw us, Lord, in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our hearts are burdened for your church, Lord. Our hearts love your people. Our hearts Lord, cry out to you, Lord, for these, Lord, every assembly of your people. We want to have the whole body of your gifts. We want to be faithful in all your house, Lord, all your house, the house of your truth house of your life. Amen, Lord. Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Mm. Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Oh, God.